So, if you're in the medical device world, you know that ISO 1093-1 is pretty much the bedrock of biological safety. Well, get ready, because that bedrock is shifting. A huge and, frankly, pretty controversial revision is on its way, and it's coming a lot faster than you might think. We're going to get you ready for what's ahead. Just take a look at the speed of this thing. I mean, going from a first draft in late 2022 to an expected publication in 2025, that is lightning fast for a standard this critical. But here's where it gets really interesting. Look closer. The United States has consistently voted no at every single stage. That is a massive red flag, a huge point of contention we'll touch on, and it tells you right off the bat this is way more than just a simple update. Okay, so to really get our heads around what's happening, here's our game plan. We're going to start with the massive philosophical change that's at the very heart of this thing. Then, we'll dive in and decode this brand new concept of foreseeable misuse. After that, we'll look at the new rules for contact and bioaccumulation, see what's changed in the world of testing, and finally, and most importantly, we'll give you an action plan for what to do next. All right, first up, the single biggest change. And I mean it. This revision isn't just about tweaking a few rules here and there. Nope. It's a fundamental shift in how we are all supposed to think about biocompatibility. It's about moving way, way beyond the checklist. This slide really just lays it all out, doesn't it? The old 2018 standard, let's be honest, it often led to a checkbox mentality. You'd go to that famous table A.1 and just follow the recipe. Well, the new standard basically throws that whole recipe out. Instead, it demands an integrated risk management process one that's deeply woven into the principles of ISO 149071. Evaluation isn't the last thing you do. It's something you do continuously throughout the device's entire life cycle. The whole spirit of this new standard is captured perfectly right here. Analysis does not equal test. It's a huge push for more scientific thinking, more justification before you even dream about running a test. The goal is to truly evaluate the risk using all the data you have, all the scientific principles you know, not just to blindly run down a list of tests because a table told you to. Okay, so this whole risk-first philosophy naturally leads us to one of the most talked about and maybe one of the most confusing new concepts, foreseeable misuse. This one requires us to think well beyond what's written on the label. So what in the world is foreseeable misuse? Well, it's when a device gets used in a way that yeah, the manufacturer didn't intend, but it's still considered reasonable in a real-world hospital or clinic. That word reasonable is the key. We're not talking about something crazy like a surgeon using packing material as an implant. We're talking about predictable, everyday ways that people might deviate from the instructions for use. And here are some fantastic real-world examples. Think about this. A manufacturer labels a device for 30-day use, maybe to avoid some long-term testing, but they know Everybody knows it's used for months in the clinic. That's foreseeable misuse. Or how about a handle on a surgical tool that isn't supposed to touch the patient, but realistically during a long procedure it might rest on their arm? Now you have to consider the biological risk of all of these scenarios. Okay, next up, let's talk about time. Because the way we calculate contact duration is being completely overhauled. And trust me, this has massive, massive implications for how devices get categorized and what tests they'll need. Just look at this example. It's so clear. Under the old rules, if you used a catheter for 10 minutes a day for five days, well, that's 50 minutes total. Simple, limited contact. But under the new rule, any contact within a 24-hour window, doesn't matter if it's one second or one hour, it counts as a full day. So that same device is now suddenly categorized as five days of prolonged contact, which can trigger a whole new world of evaluation requirements. It's a game changer. So you're probably asking, why this crazy change? Well, it's not arbitrary. It's all based on the scientific principle of bioaccumulation. The idea is that even from really short, repeated exposures, chemicals from a device can build up or accumulate in the body over time. The standard is now forcing everyone to account for this cumulative effect, not just the simple sum of contact minutes. All right, so with all these philosophical shifts and new rules, what does it actually mean for the tests we run day to day? Let's take a look at the new testing landscape for biological effect endpoints. Here are two of the absolute biggest shifts. First, and this is a real win for the industry, the material-mediated pyrogenicity test, you know, the rabbit pyrogen test, is pretty much being removed for devices made of common, well-understood materials. That's great news. On the other hand, the consideration for genotoxicity has really expanded. 
It's not just for long-term implants anymore. Now it has to be evaluated for basically any device that has potential systemic exposure, even if it's only short-term. Okay, we've covered a ton of ground. The new philosophy, foreseeable misuse, the new rules, the testing changes, which brings us to the most important question of all. What do you do now? Let's walk through an action plan. First things first, you have to understand this term, state of the art. Because the second this standard is published, regulatory bodies, especially in Europe, will consider it the current state of the art. They are going to expect you to comply almost immediately. There's no formal grace period here. The expectation to adapt starts on day one. So here is your path forward. Step one, formally acknowledge the standard is published within your systems. Step two, immediately perform a gap analysis on all your existing products and your technical documentation. Step three, start updating your biological evaluation plans and reports to reflect this new risk-based philosophy. And step four, and this is a new point of emphasis you really need to hear, you must document the expertise of the people writing these reports. Be ready to submit their resumes and qualifications. So let's circle right back to that controversy we talked about at the very beginning. This quote from an ISO committee expert who actually voted no really sums up the big concern. While the principles might sound good, a lot of experts feel the standard just doesn't have clear guidance on how to implement these complex new ideas, leaving way too much open to interpretation. And that really leaves us with the ultimate question, doesn't it? The new ISO 1099-1 is without a doubt more complex, and in some areas it is definitely more ambiguous. It demands a much more rigorous, much more scientific approach. But will all that complexity actually lead to genuinely safer devices for patients? Or will it just create a new tangled web of regulatory hurdles? That's the billion-dollar question the entire industry is going to be working to answer.